One of the things I want to get back to then is this comment that sarcoma is a chemo-insensitive disease. I mean, I'm sure we can talk about and we will some diseases that are chemo-insensitive, but, but what's your thought on that, that myth or that statement? Anyone I think everybody think the patients are all told that. Yeah. Heterogeneity um, comes up again though, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Yeah. I mean, in uterine leiomyosarcoma, yeah. Yeah. you know, there are really objective response rates. Right. Absolutely. Um, for first-line therapy, the objective response rates to doxorubicin-based treatment or gemcitabine and docetaxel is probably really about a third of patients with, you know, clinical trial de defined partial responses, some with complete responses, some with really prolonged duration. And, um, and then even in the second line, we will see responses because there's not a lot of cross-reactivity. And those kind of numbers are really quite similar to the objective response rates you see in other solid tumors, but superior to some. So I think there's, you know, cytotoxics can work yeah. in certain histologies. I also think we speak two languages. So we discuss response and we're discussing medical response. If you told a patient their tumor shrunk by 19%, you'd say you didn't, by medical terms, you didn't respond. Every patient's going right. to say this is a response. And so I think really when we quote numbers also, we're really using this resist, which is meaningless to patients yeah. from our perspective. Um, but certainly we've all seen patients that have had very good outcomes from these drugs, and we've seen patients that haven't, but certainly there's a role for them. There's a role to use them. Yeah. Part of the misconception, I guess, in terms of patients coming in, either reading the internet or being told locally that this is a chemo-insensitive disease, gets back to the sample size. That is, if someone has just treated two patients with what we may feel is suboptimal therapy and the patients didn't respond yet had the toxicity, it's only human that they carry the impression, oh yeah, in my experience it doesn't work at all, right? And I think that perpetuates. So I think these are sort of the things that we tend to correct and say, well, there are responses that happen in one out of three patients or three out of 10 patients or whatever have you. So we can kind of get it to the reality numbers, if you will, that no, we're not necessarily being overtly optimistic that 100% yeah. patients are going to respond, but there is a fraction that will respond. And the question is, are you willing to give it a try? Yeah. And we are, so. Yeah, and, and I think it's also, and in, in building off these points, is that stability is often a victory with these diseases. Sure. So if you don't think, see these tumors shrink away, if you can really shut them down, put them into a period of quiescence, that can really be a positive outcome for some of our patients. I also think it's the difference between dealing with a typically younger patient population, not even necessarily adolescents and young adults, but our median age of metastatic patients in our clinic is probably in the late 50s, early 60s. In many of our carcinoma clinics, it's upwards of 70. You know, and those 20 years make a difference in terms of what patients' preferences are, what patients are able physiologically to put up with, and frankly, what they want to put up yeah, with, yeah, because yeah. they have a lot more to live for. So controlling disease is a positive benefit to a lot of our, you know, middle-aged and younger patients. We, we appreciate that. Yeah, I agree. So um, another source of um, uh, that chemo doesn't work, it might be a, a quick conversation about a stage three patient, maybe a six centimeter high grade yeah. tumor, and they're talking to the surgeon, the surgeon says, let's do surgery. Uh, appropriately, and, and, and maybe we would, maybe we wouldn't, depending on some additional factors, recommend chemotherapy. But when they hear that, oh, we didn't do chemo at that point, but yeah. then the recurrence comes back, they yeah. carry with them that chemo doesn't yeah. work. Mm -hmm. And so when we have our um, upfront, when we made our pathway for how we deal with things, if someone is a stage three patient with high grade, greater than five centimeters soft tissue sarcoma, even localized, we, we ask that they re, they'd be referred to the medical oncologist to have a discussion of systemic therapy that they might need for neoadjuvant or, or just to hear another perspective yeah. or for down the road. I, I think, I, I love that you use the word systemic too, right? Because we always talk about chemo insensitive, but it, it's why it's so important to get the correct diagnoses, even if we're you know stratifying into a different sarcoma subtype, because not only do we have chemo, but now we have a plethora of targeted therapies and, and really therapies that we can offer patients. So there are very few patients, if any patients, where you come in and would ever say, I don't have something for you. Um, we definitely know certain subtypes that are very chemosensitive, synovial sarcoma, the round cell component in mixoid round cell. Are there ones that you think about as chemo insensitive? Are, are there ones where you'd say, I want to look directly into a clinical trial or a targeted therapy? Well, clearly there are 
histologies where we would not recommend any of the drugs that we would talk about as mm -hmm. part of the standard of care. Mm -hmm. Alveolar soft part sarcoma, clear cell sarcoma, uh, just when it used to be called GI lyomyosarcoma. These are kind of the absolute examples, right? right? And then there is gradations. That is, there are other histologies like an extraskeletal myxoid chondrosarcoma or epithelioid sarcoma that are very marginally sensitive, and there better be a very good reason for us to recommend right. systemic therapy incorporated into a patient's treatment plan where local therapy is a real option. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then the sensitive ones like you hit them, the small yeah. cell ones that we share with the pediatric oncology colleagues and the myxoid lipos, angios, synovials where the threshold for us to recommend thera systemic therapy would be yeah. much higher because we can make an impact, we can downstage the tumor, and that may well open up other options yeah. for the patient. And the wisdom of what Shreyas just said is really important. And whenever we have our CME events and people go to our meetings, that's around the time where you start to see people's eyes glaze over and they go, <laughs> I'm never going to remember this. And you know, yeah. the next patient they see, how, how do we get that information across? And I think the simple thing is, because that was a bunch of polysyllabic peculiar pathology diagnoses, and I appreciate Just that. Just like that tongue twister. <laughs> exactly. And that's why I think it's this co collaboration between the academic centers in our field, even more than in standard practice, that we have to support the people in the community, and hopefully we can make ourselves open that we are there to support their practice and support best patient care. And, and I do think for patients with these rare diagnoses, um, they don't necessarily need a clinical trial. Are they ideal for a clinical trial? Sure. Is every single person able to travel for a clinical trial? Absolutely not. Is there a clinical trial locally that they're able to hop onto? Probably not. And so I do think it is our responsibility as well to sort of look at the best data that we have. And often, well, whether it's one or two patients that were treated on a phase one and there's a signal of activity and we're excited about it, or whether or not it's a very small phase two, I think it is our responsibility to get that information back to the local oncologist because there are drugs that are on the market that you can use off-label for several of these tumors. Um, may or may not have an effect, but certainly may have a better toxicity profile, and patients need something, and if they can't get a clinical trial, then there is our responsibility to provide that for them as well. So, maybe an example of that would be like malignant picoma, for, for example. Right. You know, weird and rare, but we have Great some, for you know, we have a rational yeah. A rational treatment, even though it wasn't rationally designed for it, but you know it's a fit for the disease. It's in NCC and guidelines. Um, it can be, you know, right. you wouldn't have to get your treatment in a major academic medical center, yeah. and yet you would, could still get the right treatment for the disease. Yeah. So th I think this is a great segue, right? Because what what we're really saying is, you know, you really have to understand the disease you're facing. You have to really think about the goals of the treatment. You really have to think: is this a localized disease or a metastatic disease? And you have to think about using local control, even with patients with metastatic disease. And then there are all these kind of caveats on these rare aspects of rare diseases. But let's kind of.